family. So good to see you out this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, and may He help us to rejoice this morning and to be glad in it. I am so thankful for our God that He is unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the eternal constant. Never have to worry about him shifting or changing. Amen. He's always the same. Amen. Whatever day that is. And I'm so thankful that we serve such a great and almighty God. Amen. Again, come right on in. Welcome to our worship service. At this time, we will have a musical selection. church family. Good morning. Truly, it's a blessing to be back in that Lord's house just one more time. Amen. I just want <clears throat> to read the scripture for the song that I'm going to sing. The scripture reading will be coming from the book of Revelation chapter 21 verses 1, 2, and 7. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Hmm. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing and the singing of the song. Out of heaven. 
and God I shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death need a sorrow no and there shall be no more crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away, and he said, Behold, I make all things new. And he carried me away in the spirit. Into that grave and high mountain. And he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. And that city, it had no need of the sun, neither for the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did light it, and the Lamb, it is the light thereof. <clears throat> In that holy city, God will make all things new. In that holy city, God will take care of us. In that holy city, He will wipe away your tears. Oh yes he will, oh yes he will, because he that overcometh, he shall, he shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. thankful for the great promise. 
We're thankful this morning for the precious Holy Spirit indwelling in us today with a great promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. We've come this morning for the purpose of the worship of God. We ask that as we look into the sacred pages, that you might open up our spiritual mind and understanding, mm. that we might not only see the truth today, yes. but that we might be doers of the truth that we do see. My. We pray this morning for Dr. Aaron E. Lavender. Thank you, Lord. This being his last. Sunday in the pulpit. Thank you for his great ministry of preaching for 40 years. Thank you. We pray for his wife, Lidore. Yes. The members of Grace Baptist Church. Bless them and encourage them today and next Sunday as they celebrate this pastor. Bless him in his time of retirement. Yes. Keep him healthy and strong. Mm -hmm. We know you're going to continue to use him in a mighty way. Bless your word to our hearts today. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Help him, Lord. Amen. 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 The incomparable God gave you a definition from the Oxford Dictionary last time that incomparable is that it is without an equal in quality and extent, matchless, unable to be compared. We saw that God is matchless in creation. That he's the only one that can say, borrow Cause something out of nothing. The Bible says through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made from things which do appear. And since God is the only one that can create, he's incomparable in creation. Questions are asked, who can measure the water in the hollow of his hand? Who can measure the expanse of the heavens? Who can measure the dust of the earth? Who can weigh the hills or the mountains? And because of our inability to be able to do any of those things to an exactness, we then know that what about the creator who created these things? He is incomparable in creation. We come then to the second point in this series. Not only is he incomparable in creation, he is incomparable in his wisdom. Follow along with me as we read verse 13 through verse 17. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or who being his counselor hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the paths of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. 
God is simply incomparable in his wisdom. And by wisdom, we're talking about that quality of having experiential knowledge. That quality that possesses good judgment. That quality of being wise. When it comes to God, there is no comparison to the wisdom that he has. God is eternal. And therefore, only God exists in eternity. You and I have eternal life because the eternal Son gave his life that we might have life. But God only is eternal in his being. His essence is eternal. And only God can exist in eternity. He is the one in creation that began time. Time began in God's creation. In the beginning, God is already in existence. There is a law in physics called the law of causality. And it simply states that every physical effect must have come from some physical cause. Evolutionists are having a difficult time with this because no matter what theory you bring forth, you still have to answer the question, what caused that? What caused that? If there was a Big Bang, what caused that? There's always cause and effect. We believe that God is the eternal uncaused first cause. Let me say it again. That God is the uncaused first cause. That creation came into being because the eternal God who has existed from all eternity spoke something out of nothing. The Bible says that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. And I believe that that was the eternal uncaused first cause. That that was the spirit of God. And so since there was no one existing with him in eternity and since in time he brought creation to us Isaiah begins to ask some questions without his answers then. Who then directed the Spirit of God? Who was God's counselor? Who taught God? Who took he counsel? Who instructed God? Who taught him knowledge? Who showed him the way of understanding? All these questions have an obvious answer, and the answer is no one. Because there is no one that can be compared to the wisdom that God has. So the answer is no one. Because God is omniscient. Yes. That means that he is all knowing. Mm -hmm. You can't instruct someone who is all knowing. You can't counsel someone who is all knowing. I'm not talking about people who think they know it all. <laughs> There's a difference. Right. So 
Sometimes we think, hey, ain't nobody tell me anything. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an omniscient God who knows everything. Doesn't have to search anything. Doesn't have to look up anything. Doesn't have to go on Google for anything. He knows it all. So who's going to be his counselor? Who's going to teach him knowledge? Who's going to instruct him? Is what Isaiah says. His creation is simply already filled with his wisdom. Now come with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 8. The writer does an excellent job in teaching us about the wisdom in creation. The book of Proverbs, chapter 8. The whole chapter is designated to remind us of the importance of God's wisdom. The language is feminine. Wisdom is referred to she or her. The Greeks carry that thought and translate the word wisdom as Sophia. But in this context, the writer is telling us, using personal pronouns in replacing wisdom, that wisdom is all up in creation. Look at verse 22. The Lord Possess me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, wherever the earth was. When there was no depth, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were, were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of the earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. The writer's talking about the Sophia, the wisdom of God, and how it was with him in creation. It is him. God is, his wisdom is ever present in the things that he has made. You and I know that that word that, that went forth is associated with none other than the logos of of John's Gospel, chapter 1, where it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things are made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. That word, that word literally means logos. The logos of God. Dr. Henry Morris, the creationist, reminds us in his writings that the majority of the founders of science and all the scientific disciplines were creationists. They understood 
this matter of the logos. And that's why in the suffix of many of their disciplines, we see logos. Biology, the logi is the, the logos. Geology is the logos. Physiology is the logos. The suffix of these words is because these founders of science were creationists and, and they believed that in their study and their research that all they were doing was finding out the wisdom of God in nature. Oh, we've come so far from this. We've come so far. But Isaiah makes it clear that there's no comparisons to the great wisdom of the Almighty. You and I have been instructed, therefore, to pray for this wisdom. Proverbs 2 and verse 6 says, For the Lord giveth wisdom, and out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. The highest thoughts in the universe are the thoughts of God. The highest ways in the universe are the ways of God. I am at my best, my absolute best. You are at your absolute best when we pray and ask God for wisdom, his wisdom, seeing things from his perspective. I will always be at my best in my decision making. Because it is simply the highest wisdom. It is the highest knowledge. It is the highest understanding. In fact, the Proverbs teaches us that, that it is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of knowledge in the first place. So we pray for it. Paul writing to Timothy about this wisdom of God reminds us that we worship that person. Writing to Timothy in the first epistle, chapter 1, verse 17, we find these words, Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We worship this all-wise being, this person, God. There's simply no comparison to the wisdom that he is. Back to Isaiah 40, we'll see, therefore, since this, this all-wise God, and there's no comparison to him, we see, then, his, his wisdom as it is compared to the collectivized culture. The collectivized culture. Look at it with me in verses 15 and verse 17. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, are counted as small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Verse 17, all nations before him are as nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing. And vanity. We see the collectivized culture in the nations, God speaking as the people groups of the earth. This would remind us of the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10, and how from Noah's three sons. Shem, Ham, and Jacob, that the nations go forth linguistically. The Tower of Babel, an example of the nations being in rebellion against God. God confounds the languages and the people are spread out over the whole earth all coming from the same father and mother, both 
directly and indirectly. Reminding us that there is a humanity of nations. We are all related, irrespective of the color of our skin, irrespective of our socioeconomics, irrespective of our education. There is a brotherhood in humanity. It is not a brotherhood and a fatherhood of God that automatically makes someone in relationship with God, however. I have to become a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. He came unto his own, his own received him not, but as many as do receive him, to them gave the power to become the children of God. But God is the father of all the nations. We are all a family. We are all related. And then Jesus' example with the Good Samaritan, love your neighbor as yourself. Who is my neighbor? Humanity is my neighbor. And when I have opportunity, I do good to what? All men. Especially those of the house. We're saying in our culture, the, the, the division among people simply based on the color of skin. But you're my brother in humanity. I'm your brother. You're my sister in humanity. I'm your brother. Regardless of where you come from, where you live, God is the one who sets, according to Acts 17, the boundaries. Sovereignly, we were born in America based on God's sovereignty. But we are all related. Unfortunately, the collectivized nations have rebelled against God. The Tower of Babel is an example of that. David in the Psalms reminds us that a collectivized culture, the nations, will continue to rebel. David says, why do the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying. This whole idea that John talks about the spirit of Antichrist, which is already in the world, is again this collectivized rebellion against God and against his standards of righteousness, against his glory, his honor. And finally, in the book of Revelation, the nations are going to come together and there's going to be a final war. We call that the war of Armageddon. Again, the nations coming together Rebellion against God. I want us to be very, very careful here because there's not too many things that will bring the world together. But certainly we've seen the world come together in this pandemic. In fact, pandemic means worldwide epidemic. And we know that this is happening because for the most part, the whole world is in a mass right now. I need to be sober-minded during these times. I need to be watchful. I need to be prayerful. I need to be mindful of how I am doing, how I am emerging during this worldwide connection. Because it always produces a, a spirit of antichrist and a spirit of rebellion against God. So I need to be mindful of my worship. I need to be mindful of my Bible study. What is amazing is that all of us have come together. This, this pandemic has made the whole world come together on the WWW, the World Wide Web. The church, Bible study, our work, our meetings, 
school, a conversation, or shopping is now in the hands of a few different companies. We need to be sober-minded. Isaiah says, however, the collective vision of these nations coming together in rebellion against God how are you going to rebel against someone who is incomparable? Mm. He says that the nations coming together against me are like a drop in a bucket. Mm. Mm. The nations coming together would be like taking dust trying to weigh it on the balance. Mm. The nations coming together are nothing. He says they are less than nothing. That is when they compare to me. David puts it this way, he who sitteth in the heavens shall laugh at all the plans mm. of rebellion. And what we're going to do against God would be like you just taking a drop in a bucket. Taking some dust and trying to weigh it when it comes to the Almighty God. He then speaks about not only the nations, but the worship of the nations apart from God. And notice Isaiah intentionally through the Holy Spirit would mention Lebanon. Look at it in verse 16. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn. Nor the beast thereof sufficient for burn off. Hmm. Sufficiency in proportion to appeasing God. Hmm. Sufficient in proportion to pleasing him. It wouldn't be enough. If you did a study upon Lebanon, particularly the mountain regions of Lebanon, you discover a title that come forth. It was called the Seers of God. You'll notice David and the building of the temple, those in the culture. Lebanon was the place. Because the mountain regions are, were, were filled with, with cedar trees. It's called the cedars of God. Mythology says that the gods came down and literally planted. That's how many trees. That's how, how beautiful the mountains were at one time with cedar trees. Isaiah knows this and he's using it as an illustration to this incomparable God. There would not be enough in Lebanon to burn. Now think about this. This burning is in relation to what he says, nor the beast for the burnt off. Historically, biblically, the burnt offering was distinguished from the other offerings because it was the one offering that was totally consumed. You recall what Abraham preparing to sacrifice his son Isaac. What Isaac said, Where? here's the wood. But where is the land? 
because it was the wood that was set on fire. The sacrifice placed upon used as a burnt offering. But God says it is insufficient for an incomparable God. Hmm. It's simply not enough. Hmm. None of the sacrifices were enough. They simply were not sufficient. All they did was simply cover up the sin. There was a remembrance of sin in the mind every year because sin was on the cover. That's why the worshiper laid his hand on the head of the sacrificial lamb to transfer the guilt of sin from your mind to the sacrifice mind. But it was not sufficient. Because the worshiper always was in remembrance that I'm a sinner. It was not sufficient. And that's why Jesus Christ had to come into the world. He was the atonement for our sin. The atonement means that God is appeased. He is pleased with the sacrifice. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made Amen. the righteousness of God in him. He is the propitiation Amen. for our sin. Amen. Sin is no longer covered. Sin has been taken away. Why? Because in Jesus Christ, the great sacrifice, Amen. it is at the baptism of John that Jesus is coming up out of the water and there's a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Isaiah says it is not sufficient. You can take all these cedars of Lebanon, take all the beasts and use them for a burnt offering. But it won't be sufficient because God is simply incomplete. God is too great. God is too excellent. And yet we come. We worship him. We praise him. We adore him. We give him what only he deserves. All the honor. All the glory. And all of the praise. Let's give God some praise. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. The incomparable God, you are incomparable in your wisdom. There's simply no one to teach you. Who's your counselor? Who instructed you who gave you knowledge? You're the eternal God. No God before you. No God after you. Only the eternal God exists in eternity. And so in the creation of time, in the creation of the world, Fill it up with your wisdom. We simply learn knowledge, wisdom, and instruction from you. You had no counselor. You're the omniscient God. And so we pray for this wisdom in this trying time to, to give us the wisdom that we need from day to day. We worship the all-wise God, the immortal, the, the invisible God that the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy. Father, we ask that you help us to grow in our knowledge and in the grace of 
of God. May this be our pursuit to count all things as done for the excellency of this knowledge. We bless you this morning. We praise your name. We thank you for so great a salvation. If there is someone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, someone who is viewing the live stream this morning, the simplicity of the gospel that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day for our justification. Father, all I have to do is say that I am a sinner. I believe you died for me. You were buried and rose again. Come into my life and save me. Your word tells us that it is in the heart that man believeth unto righteousness. It is with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. So, Father, we pray for those who are lost. Take your word this morning. Activate it in our life. And we pray this in Jesus' name.